All right, hello everybody and welcome to today's webinar on settlement house research. My name is Kathleen McKenzie, Education and Programming Manager here at American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society, and I will be your moderator for today's program. American Ancestors is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. This program today is brought to you by the Brew Family Learning Center. Our presenter today is senior genealogist of the Newbury Street Press, Eileen Curley Peranti. Eileen graduated with a BA from St. Anselm College and received an MS from American University. She has written several articles for American Ancestors Magazine and our blog, Vita Brevis. Eileen's areas of expertise include Irish, Scottish, and 19th century New England research. Eileen is going to present for about 45 minutes, and then we will have time for questions at the end. At any point during today's presentation, please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A panel found at the bottom of your screen. There is a syllabus available for purchase at our online bookstore for today's webinar. You will find a link to that in your reminder email, and I'll also include it in my follow-up email after today's broadcast. We are recording this event, and starting later today, you can freely go back and review any of the content from the presentation on our website, as well as on our YouTube channel. So without further ado, I will go ahead and turn things over to Eileen. Thank you, Kathleen. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to have the opportunity to talk to you today about settlement house research. Settlement houses first appeared in the United States in the late 1880s, modeled after London's Toynbee Hall. Located in neighborhoods largely comprised of poor and immigrant populations, the purpose of these houses was to help improve the condition of area residents, both young and old, by offering educational programs and assisting with social services. Settlement houses quickly became a vital resource for members of these communities in the late 19th and early 20th century. A number of resources are available to those researching ancestors who worked or volunteered at these settlement houses, as well as those who benefited from the programs available to members of the community. Today, I'm gonna to touch upon some of the sources available for research during this lecture and hopefully provide you with some ideas that will help you when you're conducting research. The settlement house movement has its roots in mid 19th century England. A number of social reformers were appalled by the horrible living conditions of England's working class. They believed that creating a community where people could experience learning and fellowship would greatly improve the lives of these individuals. The settlement movement grew in England in the 1880s with the focus on poor urban areas. Having settlement workers living in these areas, the hope was to enable them to help those in need with some of the issues they faced, such as lack of education, unemployment, and health issues. During the 1870s, Arnold Toynbee, a historian associated with Oxford, who sought to improve the condition of the working class, visited the Whitechapel area of East London on several occasions. Among the work he did at Whitechapel was assist in establishing public libraries in that area. Toynbee Hall, located in the East End of London and shown on this slide, was founded in 1884 by Samuel Augustus Barnett, a vicar at St. Jude's in the Whitechapel section of London. Both he and his wife, Henrietta, were social reformers who sought to help improve the conditions of that impoverished area. Residents experienced squalid conditions, overcrowded housing, and crime. Inspired by Toynbee's work, Barnett would invite students from Oxford and Cambridge to the impoverished working class section of Whitechapel to learn about social conditions. Their, object their objectives were to collect social data, provide adult education, and work to identify ways to improve the living conditions of the area residents. Among the visitors to Toynbee Hall were Americans interested in the work being done in the East End of London. 
One of those visitors was Stanton Coit, who visited Toynbee Hall for several months in 1885. Upon his return to the United States, Coit purchased a building in New York's Lower East Side and founded the Neighborhood Guild, later known as the University Settlement House, in 1886. It was the first settlement house in the United States. The Lower East Side had a heavily immigrant population who lived in less than desirable conditions. As a graduate student at Columbia University, Coit chose to live in an impoverished area of New York to learn more about the issues facing members of the community. The Neighborhood Guild provided a number of programs that were primarily focused on education and the arts. Like his own experience while attending Columbia, Coit recognized the importance of having the settlement workers reside in the area where they worked to gain a better understanding of the needs of the community. This slide shows a stereograph image of the Lower East Side around 1915. The majority of immigrants who arrived in New York City during the latter part of the 19th century and early part of the 20th century settled in the Lower East Side, many of them in cramped tenement buildings. The conditions in these buildings were so horrible that in the early 1900s, a zoning law passed that required any new tenements to be built in a way to allow for fresh air and some light to reach each apartment. This slide displays a photograph of the courtyard of the nurse's settlement dating from the 1890s. Later known as the Henry Street Settlement, it is also located in the Lower East Side and still provides social services to the community to this day. It was established in 1893 by a nurse named Lillian Wald. As a student nurse at the Women's Medical College in 1892, she offered to teach a class on home health care to a group of immigrant women at a building on the Lower East Side. On one occasion, while in that area for the class, she was stopped by a girl who asked Wald to help her mother. When they arrived at the girl's home, Wald was shocked by the conditions of the tenement apartment where they resided and found the mother had recently given birth and needed medical attention. However, she was informed that a doctor who attended to the mother left because the woman could not pay him. That incident inspired her to establish a place for the community where they could receive nursing care as well as educational programs. Another visitor of Toynbee Hall was Jane Adams, a writer, sociologist, and activist. Her visit to Toynbee Hall inspired Adams to open a settlement house in the Halstead, Halstead Street area of Chicago, Illinois for immigrants in 1889. It was named Hull House. Various ethnic groups lived in this area, including Irish, German, Greek, and Italian. She began by establishing a kindergarten, later expanding to offer a day nursery and infant care center. Secondary and college level extension classes were also offered to members of the community. Those associated with Hull House played a significant role in the enactment of ch state child labor laws, as well as the establishment of the first juvenile court in the United States, to name a few. In 1895, those connected to Hull House published Hull House Maps and Papers, a presentation of nationalities and wages in a congested district of Chicago, together with comments and essays on problems growing out of the social conditions. Later in this lecture, I will talk about some items included in this book. Another prominent figure in the settlement house movement was Robert A. Woods. While attending Andover Theological Seminary, Woods became acquainted with Reverend Dr. William Jewett Tucker, whose work fo focused on social economics. After Woods graduated, he was asked by Reverend Dr. Tucker to travel to England and visit the settlements there to gain more information about them. Like Stanton Coit and Jane Adams, he visited Toynbee Hall, spending about six months there in 1890. When he returned to Massachusetts, he gave a series of lectures at Andover Theological Seminary, 
that was later made into a publication titled English Social Movements. Shortly thereafter, he established Andover House in 1892, Boston's first settlement house. It was renamed South End House in 1895 to more closely identify with the community in which it was located. The map posted on this slide is of the South End area of Boston. You may have some difficulty reading the name of the map, but it is map illustrating the distribution of the predominant race factors in the population in a part of the South End Boston. The key located in the lower right-hand corner shows a color-coded breakdown of the different ethnic groups residing in the South End, such as Irish, Italian, and German. This map may be found in the book, In the City Wilderness, a Settlement Study, published in 1898. It was written by the residents and associates of the South End House with Robert Woods as its editor. Next, I'm gonna talk about identifying sources that may help you when researching someone who worked or volunteered at a settlement house. In some cases, you may already know the name of the settlement house, but if not, there are a few ways to find out those details. One way to discover someone's connection to a settlement house is through census listings. Perhaps the enumerator made a note on the page that the dwelling in question was a settlement house. Another possibility is that the occupation listed on a census record shows that they worked at a settlement house. Another useful resource for learning more about a person's work in a settlement house is city directories. I love using city directories when conducting research. Don't limit yourself to just looking for a person's name in a city directory listing. Take a few minutes to look at the other information provided in these city directories. I will talk about another section in directories that may prove useful to your research. I appreciate being able to conduct an online search and have the ability to locate a wide variety of books, articles, and other materials that have been digitized. While it is still important to conduct in-person research at libraries and archives whenever possible, it helps to be able to access digitized material. You may discover a person's connection to a settlement house through a settlement house's annual report or find them mentioned in an article or a book on the topic. Online searches also help us to identify the contents and locations of various manuscript collections. Although you may find useful digitized material, as I just noted, if you don't make an effort to search for manuscript collections housed at a library or an archive, you may miss out on uncovering some fantastic documents. In addition to these sources, I find that newspaper research also can lead to discovering information that provide new leads for your research. You may find articles about events and programs held at settlement houses that mention those who worked and volunteer there. Now this slide shows a screenshot of a listing from the 1900 federal census for Hartford, Connecticut. The name of the red box is Mary G. Jones. Her occupation is listed as settlement head worker, which identifies her as the head resident of a settlement house in Hartford. Another piece of information I made note of is the address, which is 6 North Street in Hartford. Now, since I don't know the name of the settlement house yet, this address may help narrow it down for me. Using the information obtained from the census record, I then checked the 1900 Hartford City Directory to see if her listing provided more details about her occupation. This slide shows her city directory listing, which notes that she was the head worker at the Hartford Social Settlement, settlement located at 6 North in Hartford. That address is a match to the census listing. Just a quick note regarding what I said about reviewing the contents of city directories for other information that could help with one's research. I am sometimes pleasantly surprised with what I find when I do this. This actually happened while checking the 1900 Hartford City Directory 
for information on Mary G. Jones and the settlement house where she worked. This particular city directory includes a list of births, marriages, and deaths that took place in East Hartford, covering one year through June 30th, 1900. The dates that these events took place are listed, and for the births, the mother's name is included in the listing, and for the deaths, the person's age at the time of his or her death is noted. Now, going back to Mary Graham Jones and her occupation, we learned from her city directory listing that she was the head worker at the Hartford Social Settlement House. This city directory's contents include a list of various societies, and I found a listing for the Hartford Social Settlement. I placed the settlement listing on this slide. Mary G. Jones is listed as, well, actually it's listed as May, but it's Mary, is listed as president and a board manager. The address is listed as 6 North Street. And we learned from this listing that the Hartford Social Settlement was organized on March 1st, 1895. A great source of information on settlement houses established in the late 1800s and early 1900s are the two publications listed on this slide. The Bibliography of College, Social, University, and Church Settlements was published from the late 1800s through 1905. You will find some of those publications online through the websites I noted on this slide. In addition to details about the various settlement houses in operation during that time period, these handbooks also contain interesting summaries on the history of the settlement house movement, as well as a list of publications written on the subject. In addition to entries pertaining to settlements in the United States, these handbooks also provide information on settlement houses located in foreign places such as England and Japan. Another source listed on this slide is Handbook of Settlements, which was published in 1911. Robert A. Woods and Albert J. Kennedy were the editors of this handbook. It is noted in the preface that this handbook served to pick up with a bibliography of college, social, university, and church settlements left off. In addition to active settlement houses, this handbook includes settlement houses that were no longer in operation. Here's a page from the Handbook of Settlements. This entry is for the Woods Run Industrial Settlement located in Allegheny, Pennsylvania. It is noted that it was established in 1905 and stated that the Woods Run section, quote, is the largest, the most thickly populated, and in some respects, the most lacking in uplifting influences. The services and programs offered by the Woods Run Industrial Settlement are noted in this entry, which included a tuber tuberculosis dispensary, a class um, on English for um, foreign born, a library and a reading room, and classes on cooking, sewing, clay modeling, and typing. Those who participated in the programs and services offered by the settlement house did not typically reside there, but some of the workers and volunteers did board there. In the case of the Woods Run Industrial Settlement, it is noted in this entry that there were four women and one man who resided there and that they had 35 female and six male volunteers. When applicable, these entries also contain a list of publications related to the settlement house. For this particular settlement house, there were several annual reports and a journal article available. When I checked the handbook of settlements for the Hartford Social Settlement, I located the entry for the Social Settlement of Hartford, which is shown in the slide. Like the entry for the Woods Run Industrial Settlement, this entry provides information about the history of the settlement house and the services offered to the community, which included a reading room, a clothing bureau, study hour for children, and classes in cooking, housekeeping, and sewing. According to this entry, 
the neighborhood included Jewish, Italian, Irish, and Polish residents. The aim of the settlement house is also noted, which read in part that its goal was to, quote, provide a center for the social life of the neighborhood and to serve as a common ground for all classes of society where they may meet to know and understand one another. We also learn an additional piece of information about Mary Graham Jones in the century. There is a list of people who served as head resident from the time the settlement house was established through the current time, which was 1911. It is noted that the current head resident was Mary and that she became head resident in December, 1898. The address changed from 6 North Street in earlier sources to 15 North Street in this 1911 listing. Just to give you an idea of what the entries are like in the publication, Bibliography of College, Social, University, and Church Settlements, I've included this image of the entry for the Social Settlement of Hartford that was included in the edition dated 1900. It's a similar format to the entries in Handbook of Settlements with details about its origins, the number of resident and volunteer workers, services offered, and publications pertaining to the settlement house. In this entry, some of the services listed include classes on sewing, dressmaking, cooking, chair caning, and drawing. It also offered a library, clubs, and quote, fresh air work which likely was a response to improve the health of those who resided in cramp and disease-ridden housing. To locate the names of those who worked and volunteered at settlement houses during a particular time period, be sure to check manuscript collections and digitize publications for the annual reports produced by settlement houses. This slide shows one such example available on the Google Books website. It is the 16th annual report of the College Settlement of Philadelphia. It was published in 1908. Listed in this report are resident and non-resident individuals who worked and volunteered at the settlement house. The list of residential workers includes those who are at the settlement house for a period of three months or longer, and includes the dates they first arrived there as well as the departure date when applicable. The names of the non-resident helpers, as noted in the report, were grouped together by the activities they were involved in at the settlement house. As I just noted, items such as annual reports may be found not only online, but in a number of manuscript collections. It may seem like you're looking for a needle in a haystack when thinking about searching for manuscript collections. But one suggestion is to conduct a search on the Archive Grid website. A screenshot of their website and the um, email, um, the, um, the web address is posted on this slide. I have several suggestions when searching for manuscript collections. One type of search I recommend you try is to just search for the name of the settlement house without adding things like geographical locations to your search. It will help you cast a wider net with results. For instance, if your search is just for Hull House, a wide variety of results appear. You may look at the collection title and assume it won't pertain to your research, but take the time to read the collection description to understand what materials in the collection pertain to Hull House. One of the results is titled The Robert and Ada Hicks Papers, dating from 1913 to 1988. When you read the description, you learn that Robert and Ada were former Hull House residents who later became directors of a Hull House sponsored summer camp. It's also noted that this collection is part of the Jane Addams Memorial Collection, which provides you with an additional collection to check for items of note. If you conduct a search using a geographic location, it may rule out collections housed in another state from where the settlement house was located. When searching for collections pertaining to the Alliance of Cambridge Settlement Houses, for instance, one of the results shows a collection by that name. Cambridge refers to a city in Massachusetts 
but the collection is housed at the University of Minnesota. This slide shows details about a collection named the Records of Denison House, 1890 to 1984. This collection is located at Harvard University's Schlesinger Library. I didn't create a snapshot of the entire page because it's already difficult to read at this size, but it shows the details section, includes information about the size of the collection and gives an overview of the collection's contents. It also provides background information on Denison House. Again, everything, not everything posted on this page appears on my slide, but you'll note that on the right-hand side of the page, a box titled Topics, your search results will include a list of topics that may be closely related to what you are researching. A number of results also include a box containing links to individuals who are connected to the subject of your search. Some of you may recognize this individual in this photo. Of course, her name is listed on the slide as well, so it isn't much of a reveal for you. But over the course of your research, you may find interesting information about some of the people involved with settlement houses. Amelia Earhart attended college, but left shortly before she completed her degree to work as a nurse's aide during the First World War. After her time as a nurse's aide, Amelia applied for a job at the Denison Settlement House in Boston, where she was hired in the mid-1920s and worked for three years. During her time at the Settlement House, she was in charge of adult education and organized various women's clubs, and she also headed the girls' program. Newspapers are a valuable resource for locating information about the activities of settlement houses, its workers and volunteers, and those who participate in the settlement house programs. There are a number of digitized newspapers available online through both free and subscription-based websites, including newspapers.com, genealogybank.com, and Chronicling America, Historic American Newspapers. It's available through the Library of Congress website. Not all newspapers are available online, so it is important to contact area libraries and archives to see if they have any newspaper collections on microfilm. Locating documents pertaining to individuals who participated in the programs and services offered at settlement houses can take some work. If you find references to an ancestor's connection to a settlement house, you may need to cast a wider net and think outside of the box in order to find additional information. For example, if the person you are researching participated in a particular settlement house program and you don't find your ancestor named in the records, check for anyone else who may have been part of the program. There was a program offered through several settlement houses called Caddy Camp, where boys from the city were sent to golf courses in New Hampshire and Maine, where they served as caddies. It was a way to give them some structure and have them active out in the fresh air. Some of the participants of this program later became prominent members of society. You may come across documents, photographs, or newspaper articles for that individual that in turn may provide information about others involved in this program. Now, I know this is a very specific example that won't always work, but it does illustrate the way one can think outside the box and try to identify other sources that may name the individual you are researching. The following are a few types of sources that may contain information you are searching for. As with settlement workers and volunteers, when searching for information about participants of settlement house programs, take the time to review the contents of manuscript collections. Conduct a thorough search of documents such as meeting minutes or the papers of the head resident. While looking through the manuscript collection for the Little House Settlement House, I came across a few interesting documents, which I will talk about momentarily. Now, some background on the Little House. It was located in South Boston, Massachusetts, and it was established in 1906. One fact about the Settlement House that I liked was that they let the neighborhood children name the house. The Little House provided a variety of programs and services for those living in the area. 
including visits to the sick and elderly, classes on cobbling, sewing, and cooking, and a kindergarten for area children. A number of residents were unemployed, so volunteers at the settlement house would visit area factories and businesses to try and locate job openings. Now this is a page from the settlement house's Mother's Club records. It's a membership list from January, 1923. Although the first names of the members are not provided, their addresses are noted. Using the surname and addresses, one can check sources such as city directories from the 1922-1923 period to match them with the city directory listings of spouses or their given names if they were widowed. This is a great source for determining whether an ancestor participated in any of the settlement houses, clubs, or programs. Do not rule out the possibility that you may find details about your ancestor in records such as board of directors meeting minutes. For this example, it is noted in the Little House Board of Directors meeting minutes dated March 6, 1922, that John Feeney, a member of the house, was in the surgical ward at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. They go on to state that his hospital bed was endowed by Mrs. Emerson and Mrs. Brown, which, quote, makes it possible for him to be there. About a month later, a board of directors meeting was held on April 2nd, 1922. It was reported in the meeting minutes that John Feeney died. Quote, the house feels greatly the loss of John Feeney, the boy who had the longest membership in the house and who died suddenly at the Massachusetts General Hospital after a severe operation from which he had been expected to recover. Five house workers attended the funeral. Using the meeting minutes, um, the dates of March 6, 1922 and April 2nd, 1922, I checked Boston death records for John Feeney and I located his death certificate. From there, I used vital records, newspapers, city directories, and census records to piece together details about this family. His parents were both from Ireland and they had a total of six children, two of whom died as infants. John's father, Patrick, worked as a laborer in Boston on a coal wharf, and he was killed in a work accident when John was 13 years of age. When searching for manuscript collections, be sure to carefully review the collection information provided. As noted in this example, the North Bennett Street Industrial School records include documents pertaining to day nursery students and their families, as well as the names of staff and campers of the Boxford Camp and the Maplewood Caddy Camp. Those documents could potentially contain information about those who benefited from the services of the settlement house. Check these listings for links to finding aids and make note of any information as to whether the collection is held at the repository or if they're off site. If you plan to look at the documents in person, you may need to arrange to have them taken from the off site location and time for your visit. I covered this source when talking about settlement workers and volunteers, but conducting a check of newspaper databases may prove to be successful when looking for participants of these programs. Now, even if you don't locate any documents directly related to your ancestor, don't consider it to be a waste of time. Settlement house records can still provide you with a snapshot of the community where your ancestor resided. Annual reports include information about programs offered to the community, which varied over the years based on the changing needs of area residents. For instance, during the influenza epidemic in 1918, Volunteers at the Little House Settlement House in South Boston prepared 84 hot meals that were delivered to the sick who were too ill to buy or prepare meals for their families. A number of meals prepared by the Little House staff also were delivered to nurses who were tending to those stricken with influenza. Regarding my own research, I learned that my father participated in the caddy camp program as a young teenager. And although I didn't find any documents pertaining to him, 
I still learned a lot about the program and what his experience was like. Here are a few other sources that may help you learn more about the community where your ancestor lived. Maps contain a wealth of information that can prove useful to your research. Start by conducting a broad search for maps pertaining to a geographical area, such as Chicago. Focus on maps created during the time period you are researching, such as the time frame when your ancestor resided in an area where a particular settlement house was located. Check books on settlement houses. For some of the maps I will show you momentarily were from books. And also be sure to contact area libraries and archives to inquire about their local history collections. They may have maps among their holdings that are beneficial to your research. This map is titled Nationalities Map Number Three, Polk Street to 12th, Beach Street to Pacific Avenue, Chicago. Originally published in the book, Hull House Maps and Papers in 1895. It is also available online through the Norman B. Leventhal Map and Education Center at the Boston Public Library and on the David Rumsey Map Collection website. There's a key located on the left-hand side of the map indicating the different ethnic groups that lived in the neighborhood. It is also noted on the map that if an area isn't in color, the structure represented in the map is a factory or store. Now here's a similar map covering a nearby neighborhood in Chicago, also printed in 1895. If your ancestor resided in this neighborhood, this provides a nice snapshot of the area and the individuals who resided there. This is a great map that provides a breakdown of the residents' wages, weight, um, ranging from $3 and under to over $20. Now I showed this map in a previous slide, but it is another example of maps that one can locate in books, such as this one on the South End Settlement House. Town and city annual reports are another useful source for your research. A number of these reports are comprised of multiple department reports covering topics related to health, schools, and public safety. It is worth the effort to review these reports to learn more about the community where your ancestor resided. For instance, the annual reports for Boston, Massachusetts are available online covering the years 1834 to 1970. Some annual reports such as the registry department's reports from the early 1900s, include a number of tables providing information about vital statistics and fluctuations in population rates over a period of time in various neighborhoods around Boston. Now, this is an example of one of the tables provided in the 1907 annual report for Boston's registry department. It provides information about the area of South Boston profiled in the table and gives details about the different causes of death over a period of time. Um, the table from the previous slide notes that the information provided relates to Boston's Ward 13. If you come across this and aren't sure about the ward number you want, go back to city directories and check for a section on street listings. The image on this slide is taken from the 1907 city directory for Boston. If I was trying to figure out the ward number that corresponds with A Street in South Boston, this list notes that it is located in Ward 13. Ward numbers also appear on documents such as census records. One may wonder whether settlement houses are still in existence and the answer is yes. Over the years, certain settlement houses closed or merged with other houses, but many still provide services to the community. You can find details about a number of these settlement houses online. Many of them provide a history of their agency, so you may find that several former settlement houses merged and currently operate under a different name. I hope this was of 
help to many of you. I know that I um, threw a lot of information out there. It's a broad um, information about the Selman House research. Um, if there's any questions? All right. Thank you so much, Eileen, um, for that excellent webinar. Um, yes, if you do have any questions, please do feel free to type them into the Q&A panel found at the bottom of your screen. Um, first off, we had a question come in um, that I'll answer about whether or not there's a syllabus for today's program. There is. Um, Eileen compiled an excellent syllabus summarizing a lot of the information included in the presentation um, and listing out the specific sources available. Um, if you're interested in that, it's available for purchase on our website in the bookstore section, and there will be a link included in the follow-up email that you'll get later today. All right, so um, Eileen, we also have a question here from somebody who's wondering um, if settlement houses were only in major cities or, um, you know, how could they find out if there was a set settlement house in their smaller city that they live in? So depending on the time frame that you're interested in checking, I would check the uh, Handbook of Settlements and the other publication, the bibliography that I mentioned. Um, you could also, if there are um, city directories for that area, um, for the time period that you're interested in, um, like I said, check the front and back matter of the directories and see if they have um, societies um, other um, social service information, things like that. I would also, um, if it's um, more recent and that you were trying to find, um, you know, if, if there was something during a, a later period, uh, you could also, I would try local libraries and archives. They, um, especially local libraries, a lot of them have local history rooms and they might have information or at least direct you to um, some sources that might help answer that question for you. Great, thank you. Um, we also have a question here from someone wondering, were settlement houses typically run by certain religious groups, for example, Jewish, Catholic, Unitarian, et cetera? So it varied. Um, it depended, you know, like a lot of times um, they might have received funding from a particular organization um, some of them were through university work. Um, the, the great thing about um, some of those entries in the handbook of settlements is that it sometimes has um, as part of its description, um, who organized it, uh, who funded it, um, you know, and, and provide more details about it. And then also, um, if you look in some of the manuscript collections, you may um, find more detailed information about uh, you know, they might have had uh, meetings when they were first organizing it, and that might provide you some more detailed information about um, if there was a particular group that was uh, that played a role in the establishment of it. All right, great. Thank you, Eileen. Um, another question here, uh, you had mentioned the whole house um, and someone says, I'm trying to find copies of the whole house yearbook for the early 1920s when my grandmother was a social worker there. Um, do you know if those yearbooks for the whole house are available online? Um, I haven't searched in particular for that, but I have over the course of you know, my own research and looking um, at information for this lecture, there's a lot of information out there. I'm sure you know on, on the Hull House. Um, I would start by trying to check and see if there's something digitized online. I would also check um, maybe some area Chicago libraries and archives to see if they have a collection. And then, like I said, check Archive Grid. It's it's really cool how um, if you just type in Hull House, I, I only looked at just the first page and there were multiple pages pertaining to Hull House um, in different uh, manuscript collections. You might find somebody who either um, has a collection of the yearbooks um, or might have been from one of the classes that your, um, you know, that your relative was uh, involved in and um, take it from there and you could uh, try to see what's available. Thank you. Um, someone else here asks, um, they mentioned that smaller towns had poor farms. Um, would that be similar to a settlement house? Um, I don't know a lot about poor farms, but what I would do is 
uh, a lot of um, the, I know I keep going back to the, the handbook. Uh, you could also find out online if there's an agency from that area, they might have um, a history where they um, merged with an earlier agency, but they, they'll sometimes provide descriptions about um, if there was joint work. I know that um, there was a lot of outreach. There was a lot of um, attempts to, um, you know, better people's lives in a variety of ways, whether it was preventing crime or education on employment opportunities and such. So I would try to see what was available as um, settlement houses for that particular area and then try to see if um, there's any connection to it. Uh, I would check newspapers. There might be some mention of, of um, some programs or you know any kind of outreach from that. And hopefully you might be able to get an answer. Great, thank you. Um, someone else is wondering, did many residents only stay for a few years or was it common to stay for a lifetime? So it varied. Um, I know of, uh, I'm, as you know, I'm in the Boston area. There's a, um, a settlement house that was in Lynn, Massachusetts and a mother and a daughter. Um, one of them was the head resident and then the other one assisted and they were there for a very, very long time. Um, there are others who might have uh, moved on and gone off to, um, you know, uh, work in other areas. Um, a lot of uh, the volunteers were um, from colleges, some students, um, gra recent graduates. So that might have been a springboard to other um, social work that they got involved in. Uh, the directories, um, annual reports and things like that, they, they really do have a lot of great information about who worked um, during a certain time frame. So you might be able to trace out and see like who was there for a long time and who only stayed a short time. Great, thank you. Um, we also have a question here from someone who um, is curious about kind of the quality of life in settlement houses. Um, do you know, or, or do you know where someone might be able to find this out, kind of what life was like in the settlement house? Um, was it generally positive or, um, you know, in other institutions, uh, this person mentions, you know, there's sometimes abuse and things like that. Um, do you know kind of what the quality of life was like in the settlement house? So I think a good way to try to find that information, because it it would likely vary from place to place, is a combination of um, if you're able to get um, uh, a, able to look through some meeting minutes, some administrative uh, material on the particular um, settlement house, combined with um, you know when you conduct a search on a site like Archive Grid and you find material related to a particular um, settlement house, you might find, and I can't remember offhand, but I, I, I feel like I saw a reference to somebody's diary um, and it was a former employee, a former resident. So you might be able to gain some insight going that route. Great, thank you very much. Um, Let's see here. We also had a question from someone wondering, um, did you have to be a resident to receive services from the local settlement, settlement house? Um, I think they covered like a particular area. There were, I think there was some that actually as um, the population changed and people moved out, uh, some of them merged. So I, I think they tried to cover a particular area, but I don't believe they would turn away somebody if they requested services or they might direct them towards um, another one that might give them more appropriate offhand. I'm not totally positive about that, but that is a great question for me to look into. Sure. All right. Um, we also have a question here um, from somebody who mentions uh, that they have a cookbook um, called the Settlement Cookbook from a Milwaukee Settlement House. Um, and they're wondering how they might find uh, if there are other cookbooks available from other settlement houses. Um, where would you might where would you recommend uh, looking for something like that? I actually did see online there were some uh, cookbooks. I I didn't go through them, so I'm not sure if it's just a listing through Google books and they don't show, you know, it's not a total ebook, um, but you might be able to um, 
find out where you can obtain those, I would conduct a search online and um, do settlement house cookbooks. I, I, I was looking for particular settlement houses and I know that there were some that um, that had them. And actually, again, I keep going back to archive grid, but I, I feel like when I was looking through the entries, because they vary, some people had scrapbooks containing um, you know photos and articles related to uh, settlement houses. That's that's why I thought it was so great to just focus on typing in the name of the settlement house and see what pops up. Because if you just keep it broad, you might be surprised at what you can find in these collections. So you might even be able to find a manuscript collection that contains the original cookbooks. So I would try online and check manuscript collections. Great. Thank you so much, Eileen. Um, all right. So I think um, that just about wraps up our time for questions today. Um, but if we didn't get to your question, or if you do think of one later on, um, you can contact us at education at nehgs.org, or you can also chat with our genealogists for free online Monday through Saturday from 9 to 5 Eastern time. Uh, this service is free and open to everyone and can be accessed at AmericanAncestors.org slash chat. Thank you again for joining us um, and big thank you to Eileen for that wonderful presentation. Um, you all will have an opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback on today's webinar. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any feedback is very helpful and appreciated. This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of our members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American Ancestors to help keep these programs free and to create more. If you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center at AmericanAncestors.org education. Thank you again, and I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.